everyone. It's a privilege to share the stage with so many inspirational speakers today here at Durban Digital Day. So thanks to the organizers for making it possible. Um, the topic of my presentation is probably slightly different to most of the other presentations that have taken place today and that will take place. In fact, it's probably different to any presentation you've ever heard, unless you've heard one of my talks before in Durban. Because today I will be talking about what I think is the single most exciting and fascinating idea that I've ever come across. It's also possibly the most ambitious project that humanity has ever embarked upon. Never mind humanity, it's the most ambitious project since life began four billion years ago on this planet. The idea and the vision is to settle not only human life but also plant life on the planet Mars within a decade. So I hope to tell you a bit more about this project during this talk. So this is the first question that people usually ask me. So I would just like to spend a bit of time running through the Mars One project concept so that even if you still think I'm crazy at the end of the talk, at least I'm going to show you that there are a few other people in the same boat and that the project is possibly just crazy enough to actually work. So the concept is to settle humans on Mars by 2025. The idea is to send the first four in 2024 and then every two years after that to send another four. The founders of the idea, or the non-profit organization that's called the Mars One Project, is Bas Landstorp and Arno Wielders. They are based in the Netherlands, but this is in fact an international project, so I will tell you more details about that. Okay, the second shocker, not only that people will be going to Mars, but that they won't be coming back. So there are a number of reasons for requiring this project to be a one-way trip initially. Um, amongst them are the medical reasons and also the technological reasons, but basically the Mars One project is um, proposing to pull off this project with existing technology. So the kind of technology necessary to bring people back doesn't currently exist, and that's why it's, uh, it's proposed as a settlement mission. So how much will it cost? They've drawn up a budget to send the first four of six billion dollars. So um, how do they raise money for this? Well, there's, on, there's an online sort of crowdfunding campaigns going on, there's merchandising, donations from high net worth individuals. But then the million dollar or billion dollar question remains, how do they actually plan to raise this kind of money? Because the types of funding campaigns that I've just listed are probably not going to be enough and they are not using any government funding or taxpayers' money for this mission. Okay, the other bombshell to drop is that they plan to fund this possibly most ambitious science project that's ever been proposed. They propose to fund it through an international media event. So yes, that logo, um, DSP is a company owned by the Endemol company. You may know the name Endemol because they're the broadcasters of Big Brother. So there is an element of reality TV in this, but I th I'm not against that because this is a project in which all of humanity should share after all. And the idea that it will be broadcast at every point in the build-up as well as the uh, mission to Mars, as well as the settlement of the humans on Mars, I think is a great possibility to let everyone experience this um, project together. So, if I could sum up what this Mars One project concept is, because I think it's revolutionary not only in its scientific and technological aspects, but also in its business model, um, is basically, they want to settle humans on Mars in less than a decade. They want to outsource all of their technology, and they want to fund the whole thing through a media event. They've also outsourced part of their marketing campaign. Um, we're sort of seeing it as we speak, whereby people like me, other candidates around the world, are doing the marketing for Mars One. So I don't have time to go through all of the astronaut requirements and the training program, but I will refer you to the website, the Mars One website, where all this information is available. Um, yesterday we received an email update, so this is kind of breaking news. Just yesterday we heard that the next round, so I'm um, sorry, presently there are 705 candidates left. We're in round two. To, the, to determine who will get to round three, there will be an online interview, and that will determine who goes through to round three. So please see the website if you'd like to know more about the training. Um, so there are 19 South Africans still left amongst these 705, and um, you're free to check their videos online on the Mars One website, but basically I think these people must be amongst some of the most interesting people on the planet, and I look forward to meeting them in the future. So that was the concept, the model. Um, let me now talk a bit about the technology. So they've claimed that they can pull this mission off with currently existing technology, so let's look a bit at the technology. First, we need to know what, uh, what aspects of Mars do we need the technology for. Basically, humans will not survive very long on Mars without technology, maybe about 30 seconds. So <laughs> we certainly will be relying heavily on technology, we'll be relying completely on technology. Um, so 
sort of uh, on a tourism level, Mars actually has the second highest mountain in the solar system, and also the Valeris Marinaris Canyon dwarfs the Grand Canyon. So there's interesting things to check out and uh, Instagram on Mars as well. Um, Mars is red because of the iron oxide. The, so, the day, which is called a sol on Mars, is actually only 39 minutes longer than a day on Earth, so these things are comparable. Um, there are seasons, it rotates around the sun in uh, 1.88 Earth years. Okay, the distance between Earth and Mars varies as these two planets orbit around the sun, but it's around about sort of less than 200 million kilometers. So the gravitational acceleration on Mars is around about a third of that on Earth, so that means you can jump three times as high with the same force. And uh, the weather is not ideal, and that's just not from a Durbanite's point of view. Um, it's about minus 70 degrees Celsius on average, so it's pretty cold. And the surface pressure is another way that you can die on Mars, because it's not 0.6, but 0.6% of the pressure on Earth. So that's equivalent to being about 30 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, um, low pressure. Uh, there's no evidence of a global magnetic field. Um, and these are some facts about Mars that will help us to understand why we need these technologies. So, as I've said, they've claimed that the technology already exists. Let's see. So, the payload, which includes all of the equipment um, that is necessary to support the humans, will be about 50 tons, apparently. A, a number of these payloads will be sent before the humans actually arrive. So, what will be the rocket that will do the heavy lifting? That will, has been proposed to be SpaceX's Falcon Heavy which after testing and launch next year sometime will be the world's most powerful rocket with a lift force equivalent to about 15 Boeing 747s. Um, the living module is where the um, astronauts will live on the way to Mars for about seven months, which is how long it takes to get there. And this will have a mass of about 20,000 kgs. So the lander, the landing technology is difficult because without an atmosphere, so on Earth when you land, the atmosphere slows you down a lot. Mars, in the absence of an atmosphere, means you will come plummeting to the surface fairly fast and with such a heavy payload, you will need to have some sophisticated landing gear in place. Um, Lockheed Martin has been contracted um, to develop this landing gear. So a lot of the kids that I've talked to have asked, is there TV on Mars? Is there internet on Mars? Most certainly. Okay, never mind um, <laughs> the fact that we still want to check our email and you know, watch YouTube videos on Mars. The mission relies heavily on communication with Earth, of course, on a scientific and technological level. So two, two satellites will be in place. Um, sorry, Satellite Technologies Limited has been contracted for the satellite development. And this means that there will be permanent communication between Mars and Earth. However, and this is not something we're going to overcome anytime soon. The time that a communication signal takes to travel over 200 million kilometers is between 3 and 21 minutes, depending on how close Earth and Mars are. So this is a fundamental limit according to the way we understand reality at the moment. And um, this doesn't bode well for kind of Skype conversations. I think communication will be more in terms of uploading video clips. Um, and this is not something that we can over overcome in the foreseeable future but there will be permanent communication between Earth and Mars. So the rovers, the rovers will arrive ahead of the humans to find a location for the settlement, to set up the settlement, and also to help with the heavy lifting once the humans have arrived. Um, of course, the astronauts, when outside of the location, of outside of the habitat, will have to wear a suit. I've mentioned the pressure, um, the temperature, um, as well as the atmosphere, which is not breathable, are the reasons for this. So this company has been a potential Mars suit supplier. Okay, obviously you need power. All of this technology that's going to keep you alive on the planet Mars needs power. Where does that power come from? The sun. Mars is just the planet next door in the solar system. It's further away than Earth from the sun, but the sun is still a power source for Mars, so there will be um, photovoltaic panels which will power the whole settlement. And uh, basically, in situ resource utilization is kind of the phrase by which um, you will use as many resources on Mars as possible. So one of the reasons that settling on Mars is possible is that there's a large amount, well, fairly large enough, there's water in, this, uh, water in the soil. Because it's low pressure and low temperature, this is obviously in the form of ice. But basically, the rovers that are already on Mars, what they've dug up, has shown to be 2% by mass H2O. So this H2O will be extracted from the soil by the rovers, taken back into the habitat, melted into water. From the water, you can separate the hydrogen and the oxygen into oxygen, which you add to the atmosphere to breathe, and hydrogen, which can be used as a fuel. So the living units, there's some kind of artist's impressions of what the living unit will look like. 
I think it's nice that the plants get the same living space as each of the humans. So this is one of the aspects of the mission that I enjoy, that it's not actually the settlement of humans on Mars, is it? Um, the idea would be to make this a sustainable settlement, so the food will come along, all the bacteria in our bodies will come along, all of the things that we need to survive will come along. So in the end, we'll have this kind of little ecosystem from Earth, which we will try to settle on Mars. So some of the sort of questions that come up, um, one of the dangers of such a mission would be the high radiation exposure levels. So as a physicist, I had to sneak one calculation in here, but I promise you it's not hard. So basically, I just looked around on the internet, and the European Space Agency, as well as NASA, sets the maximum lifetime radiation exposure of a single human to 1,000 millisieverts of radiation. Now, if I remember correctly, this increases your chances of getting cancer by 3%. This is considered the maximum. So on the way to Mars is the most dangerous period where, as uh, during the journey, you can be exposed to up to 400 millisieverts of radiation. Um, subsequent to arrival on Mars, if you spend one hour per day outside, um, you accumulate 10 millisieverts per, per year. Okay, so let's say you live on Mars for 60 years. That's 600 plus 400. You're still within the tolerated amount of radiation. What about uh, protein? Well, luckily I've lived in Asia, so I've got over the <laughs> idea of eating insects, which I have done. So um, one of the benefits of radiation is that the cockroaches that are exposed to radiation in the space station have been shown to be bigger, faster, and stronger than cockroaches that were born on Earth. So I don't know whether this is a good or bad thing, but the Russians have been doing some interesting research in space. So that was a quick overview of the technology. But um, of course there's controversy, and you may have read lately online that the settlers will die within 68 days according to an MIT study. There are plenty of hurdles in this mission, plenty of hurdles. By the way, the US only announced plans to go to the moon less than 10 years before they achieved that goal. So I think we should um, look to the words of Nelson Mandela in this case and say of course it always seems impossible until somebody does it. So I've gone through the concept, the technology necessary for this mission. You might still have the question, what on Earth for? Why would you want to leave Earth? Why would you want to settle on Mars? And there are a number of, my, number of reasons for this. So I particularly like what um, Kelly said, who's another round two Mars candidate, where she reminded us of the names of the, of the um, expeditions to the New World, Opportunity, Curiosity, and Spirit. So for me, the scientific objectives of the mission are the most exciting, and the idea that we may settle life on Mars, but not only settle life on Mars, also possibly discover evidence of life on Mars, is one of the most exciting scientific prospects of our age. So one of the biggest open questions in science is how did animate matter, life, emerge from the inanimate matter from which it is created? What is the actual difference between a bunch of molecules and a simple living organism? If we could find evidence of life on Mars, whether it's ancestral to life on Earth, or whether it's distinct to life on Earth, would be a giant leap in science towards answering these age-old questions of who are we and where have we come from. So, in fact, I found this online a statement by the Pope the other day. I think for once in my life I can say the Pope is more controversial than me because he's gone even further to say that extraterrestrials will also be welcome in the Catholic Church. So, that's great stuff. <laughs> Okay, so scientific, there are scientific and technological motivations for this mission. I think technologically, in the next 10 years, we can expect immensely exciting and interesting and uh, amazing innovations to emerge in the technological arena in preparation for this mission. So the idea of this mission is not only for everyone to watch it on TV, but they're planning to outsource all of their technologies. If anyone here or if anyone in the world has a technology or a company or an idea that they believe could contribute to this mission, they are welcome and have been invited to contact Mars One on the website. So I think the kind of things that will emerge in preparation for this mission globally will be an extremely exciting thing to watch. But there's, a, I think, moving to another planet is an eventuality. So humans are naturally explorers, um, and people also ask me what do my parents think about this mission, so I'll have to credit this link to them, where they liken this whole adventure to that of our ancestors, who probably didn't see it as an adventure, who um, had to escape sort of some kind of war or persecution in Europe on both sides of the family, and came to South Africa in the 1600s on a ship 
on a one-way trip, unable to afford a return trip, never having spoken to anyone who'd been to South Africa before. This, um, my surname, Maria, is actually the second boat after Van Rebeck, so but certainly none of them had heard an account of someone who'd moved to South Africa at that point. So I'm just trying to relate this to things that have already happened in history, that it's actually not such a crazy idea that it has been done many times before. It's just that now, through sort of social media, the internet, and all sorts of things we've been hearing about today, the Earth is getting smaller not only the way we imagine the Earth, but also physically. If you have enough money, you can fly from Joburg to Sydney to Tokyo to New York back to jo uh, Joburg in, this, in one day or however long it takes, 48 hours, I'm not sure. So the world is getting smaller. The next uh, horizon is beyond the one that we see on Earth, and indeed it is in space. So I think it's an eventuality that we are going to move to space, and that's why I find it an honor to be involved in this thought revolution, which is sort of preparing people's hearts and imaginations and minds for this expansion of life beyond what we have called home for the last four billion years. Okay, but there's even another motivation for this mission, rather than it's an eventuality. So have any of you ever taken out insurance on a commercial airline's flight? Um, mostly I take the no bucks for that, but if you have, did you know that your chance of dying in a commercial airline's flight is something like one in 200 million? The chances that in one human lifetime, let's say 100 years, the Earth is hit by an asteroid over 500 kilometers in diameter are one in 200,000. So I'm not trying to tell you that you're gonna die, I'm just trying to weigh up the statistics to tell you that it's a thousand times less likely that you're gonna die in a commercial airline's flight than that Earth will be either destroyed or the climate on Earth will be destroyed by a large asteroid. So if this is not a motivation to find another place besides Earth to begin to make habitable, then I don't know what is. And thank you so much for your attention today. In conclusion, I would like to say the sky is most certainly not the limit. And yeah, thanks for listening. I hope I've been able to share a bit about the project.